Munich and welcome to this edition of the Max Planck Forum entitled COVID-19 from vaccination to medication. My name is Monica Jones. I'm a business and science anchor for German International TV. And it is my great pleasure to guide you through the program of this very special evening. Now special because of this evening's impressive lineup of speakers. Three of the world's most outstanding scientists will share their insights with us on how to fight the current coronavirus pandemic. Those scientists are Professor Dr. Uhu Shaheen, CEO and co-founder of BioNTech, Professor Dr. Saki Pilpel, Professor and Head of the Department of Molecular Genetics at the Weizmann Institute of Science Israel, and Professor Dr. Patrick Kramer, Director of the Department of Molecular Biology at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry. And you can join the discussion. Because right next to the live stream, you see a box for the Q&A session. So please submit your questions there. Remember to press the send button. And also remember, there is no such thing as a stupid question. Keep your questions coming. During the discussion, I'll try to fit in as many as possible. Below the live stream, there is also a button labeled program. Now there you can get more information about the speakers and the program, of course, but be aware that it will take you out of the live stream, away from it. So make sure you return to that window uh, so you don't miss what's happening and what's being said right here. I'm sure you all heard of Albert Einstein, and he once said that science is international, but its success relies on institutions that are owned by nations. So when I said earlier that this is a very special evening, it also has to do with a very special partnership. This is a joint event by the Max Planck Society and the Israeli Consulate General in Munich. And as such, this evening highlights the decade-long collaborations and close relations between the Max Planck Society and Israel's outstanding science community. And talking of the outstanding science community, one of the speakers now during the welcome notes is Professor Alon Chen, president of the Weizmann Institute of Science. He will join us online. And perhaps you remember not long ago, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, when she visited Israel for the last time as German Chancellor, she was uh, presented with a postdoctoral fellowship for outstanding women scientists in chemical physics, presented by Israel President Isaac Herzog and Professor Chen. So there you just see the close relationship. And of course, I'm also very, very happy to have our two co-hosts of this evening here in the studio with us in Munich. Her Excellency Carmela Sharmir, Consul General of the State of Israel in Southern Germany, and Professor Ulman Lindenberger, Vice President of the Max Planck Society. Dear ladies and gentlemen, imagine a world in which humans have been exposed to a new dangerous virus. And imagine that in this world, which has become ours, there would be an event that brings together a geneticist from the Weizmann Institute of Science, a geneticist from the Max Planck Society, and the person who has been leading the most successful operation to develop a vaccine against this virus. Wouldn't that be an event that you would be interested in attending? Well, on behalf of the Max Planck Society, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to exactly this kind of event. And in doing so, I would like to thank my co-host, Her Excellency Ms. Shamir, for the smooth and congenial collaboration in preparing it. As Her Excellency has already mentioned, the research community in Israel and the Max Planck Society have been close companions for a long time. Even before the establishment of diplomatic relations between Israel and Germany, researchers from the Weizmann and from Max Planck have been collaborating in many different fields of science just like today, for the common good and to the benefit of all of us. The last two years have allowed the general public to watch evolution unfold, evolution as embodied by a little virus. The pandemic started with its wild type, which steadily has been replaced by a range of new strains. 
predictions of the future course of the pandemic needed to be adjusted again and again as more contagious variants replaced earlier ones. Hence, we are in the midst of a race between nature and science. The evolution of the coronavirus takes time and the development of vaccines against the virus to reduce infection and prevent disease, as well as the design of drugs for treatment, also take time. A key future in this race between nature and science is to ask the right questions. For instance, and I assume we will hear more about this today, trying to understand the mechanisms that lead to errors in genome transcription may inform both vaccine and drug development. So the better we understand the evolution of the virus, the more targeted can we design vaccines and drugs. To overcome the pandemic, basic and applied science need to form a strong bond. And they have indeed formed a strong bond, a bond that brings out the best of human creativity and compassion. And on this note, I now would like to pass on to my former Max Planck colleague and now president of the Weizmann Institute, Alon Chen, whom I had the chance to visit this spring for three wonderful weeks that still shine a bright light into my life. Shalom. Shalom, everyone. Thank you very much, Ulman. Thank you very much, Carmela, for the kind words and, and, and the important uh, introduction. Um, and of course, good evening, everyone who are joining us and thank you for the kind invitation. You know, for me, and I was a former Max Planck director and a current uh, external member of the Max Planck Society and also a scientist and, and a president of the Weizmann Institute, every event of, of combining the Max Planck and the Weizmann Institute, it's uh, in one hand, it's feel very natural because of we just what we just heard about the history, but also very exciting. Uh, because of, of the quality of, of, um, of science. I, I will not repeat what Ulman and Kamala said about, about the history and, and the role that the Weizmann Institute, the Max Planck scientists, uh, uh, um, held in, in the resumption of uh, diplomatic relationship between the two countries, just focusing in, in more recent decades. You should know that um, uh, every year uh, around, we have around 30 different projects uh, a collaborative project between the Max Planck and the, and, and the Weizmann Institute. Uh, currently, we have ongoing 80 projects of uh, supported by the, uh, the Minerva Weizmann uh, uh, program. And as you may know, both the current and the former president of the Weizmann Institute, Professor Daniel Zeifman, both were uh, Max Planck directors. So you can see how tight are the link between uh, between our two institutions and two countries. Uh, since Tonight we're gonna. The meeting is focused on on COVID. Uh, the last uh, year and a half or more was was very challenging to all of us. I think it was quite impressive to see how both the Max Planck Society and the Weizmann, uh, despite the limitations, uh, continue doing doing science. Uh, never really closed labs or any uh, service facilities, and our scientists continue doing both the regular science and also very much involved in COVID-related research. When this uh, pandemic started, uh, the white man actually had only a single lab working on lethal viruses. And in a matter of, of days to few weeks, we had more than 65 projects, 65 research groups, uh, not actually not coming only from the biomedical part of campus, but also physics, math, computer science, chemistry, all of them engaged in, in different aspects of COVID related uh, research. It was extremely fr fruitful years with large number of, of leading uh, uh, studies and, and publication, more than 20 patents on the, on the field of uh, COVID, and, and which in a way emphasize, I think, the, the philosophy of the Weizmann, focusing on, on excellence, focusing on curiosity-based research, and, and full academic freedom that our scientists, although doing very basic research on a, on a, on a daily, uh, daily basis felt that this very strong medical need and, and were agile enough to, to recruit themselves and, 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 and answer uh, the, the, the public need and uh, involved in, in COVID-related uh, research. We are very proud with, with everything that our scientists uh, did over this uh, uh, year and a half. Um, 
maybe one important issue that I'm more personally uh, um, working on related to COVID is the fact that we're all very busy with the clinical and physiological symptoms of, of COVID and when the infection rate drops on when eventually this pandemic will, will be over. Um, also, these clinical symptoms uh, going to disappear. Nevertheless, there is a growing number of uh, mental health related issues of the COVID, which already now we have in huge number in the increase of, of depression, of, of suicidal ideation and, and suicide in, in relatively in young uh, uh, in the young group of the population. And this is something which probably will go with us for the next, for several years, even if the pandemic will, uh, will end hopefully in, in the near future. So this is another fact that we all need uh, to remember. So I will stop here and, think, and thank the organizers and of course the amazing uh, scientists, uh, my friends and colleagues, Zachi Pilpel and Patrick Kamer, and of course, uh, Uger. Uh, uh, Shaheen, and uh, thank you very much for, for having me, and good luck, and enjoy this uh, fantastic evening. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Chen, and also, of course, a big thank you to Professor Lindenberger and Consul General Shamir for their welcome words. And it's actually quite interesting that Professor Chen was uh, just mentioning another aspect of this pandemic, because before we get down to the real, the research, the very special research uh, that our three esteemed uh, guests here can share with us, I would like to actually get to the, the harsh reality that we're living with right now, because uh, the pandemic is now in its second year, but it's far from over. Here in Germany, we actually were in the fourth wave with unprecedented high levels of new infections. Uh, just a couple of days ago, the French President Macron said that a fifth wave is now approaching Europe and rolling across Europe. And Denmark, which less than two months ago had its kind of freedom day, now reintroduced new COVID-19 measures. They have a very high vaccination rate, but the virus spreads there too. So what is going on? What are we doing wrong? And how can science lead the way if we let it? And this is exactly what I would like to discuss now with the three pioneering experts we have here with us. And I've already mentioned, very warm welcome to Professor Dr. Chaki Pilpel, Professor and Head of the Department of Molecular Genetics at the Weizmann Institute of Science Israel, where he holds the Ben May Professorial Chair. His research focuses on how to redesign vaccines. We've heard about that already, and you will tell us more about it. Redesign vaccines that can basically anticipate future virus strains and react immediately. Professor Pilpel chairs the review panel of the European Research Council and was awarded the 2020 Kimmel Award for Innovative Investigation. And uh, just bear with me, when you have three such esteemed guests, you need a little bit of an introduction to give them their due. The same goes for Professor Dr. Patrick Kramer. He is director of the Department of Molecular Biology at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry, where he looks how a new generation of antivirals could control local SARS-CoV-2 outbreaks and help us better prepare for the emergence of future coronaviruses. And he will tell us more about that too. Professor Kramer recently received the Louis Jante Prize for Medicine, which is one of the most prestigious awards in Europe. So it's very good to have you here as well, of course. And uh, joining us online, there he is in the middle, Professor Dr. Uwe Shaheen, CEO and co-founder of BioNTech, of course, where he and his wife, Dr. Özlem Turici, managed to develop the first SARS-CoV-2 vaccine based on mRNA technology. He's also personal supporting member of the Max Planck Society. This year, Professor Shaheen was elected as a member of the European Molecular Biology Organization. And among the many awards he's received, uh, let me just mention the Knight Commander's Cross of the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany, which he received together, of course, with his wife this year. So very good to have you with us as well. And um, before we get down to to the research, to the science, very, very briefly, because it is so imminent and it's staring us in the face, this the situation that we're in right now, this current situation with soaring case numbers left, right and center. Um, 
I would like to have your assessment, both as a scientist, but also as a human being. Uh, was this fourth wave avoidable or is it inevitable? Professor Kramer, perhaps you would like to give us your take first. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me here. And um, I share your concern. I share your concern and I also feel some frustration. And that is because uh, many experts have warned us uh, many months ago that with the Delta variant that is now the predominant virus, uh, we need to get to very high vaccination rates, 80, 90 percent. We need to vaccinate um, the, la the vast majority of the population. And we didn't uh, achieve that goal without going into details. There's many reasons for that. Uh, many of us have um, worked extremely hard to convince people that um, the vaccines are safe and they're very efficient. And that also is what gives us hope because the vaccines really are the path out of this pandemic. And I think we just have to, despite the frustration, because we are concerned, we have to keep working to convince people that now is the time to show solidarity with the teachers who have been working so hard, with the families who have suffered so much, with health workers, all the professionals, show solidarity, get vaccinated unless you have some condition that prevents you from, and also get the booster vaccinations. We know from Israel, because they're always a few months ahead of us, um, that it's extremely um, useful to get the third vaccination, a booster after half a year or so, because the antibodies go down and the protection goes down over the you know, four, five, six months after we have been vaccinated. And if we get the third vaccination, we actually have a very strong protection afterwards. And that will lead us through the winter, which is still ahead of us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Professor uh, Shaheen, I'm not going to ask you about the vaccination because it would be unfair to ask you. I think uh, Professor Karma made a very good explanation there. But uh, from, from where you are standing, uh, did, you, did you expect that a fourth wave would, would hit Central Europe and such a harsh one? Yes, of course. So, so I, I, I made comments already in July that this is going to happen. Uh, and the reasons were outlined. Um, uh, the Delta variant ha had an um, had infection rate around seven to eight. Okay? And if you divide 100 by seven to eight, uh, you, you, you come up with, uh, with about 14. Yeah? That means you need a vaccination rate at least of 86 percent. Yeah? And to be safe, uh, uh, it, it is even better to get 90 percent. And if you don't get that, uh, then, then the virus spread will continue to spread, particularly with the challenge that we have that, um, that in the pediatric population, we have a situation with low, low vaccination rates. So that means we have an entry point and from this entry point, the virus will, will continue to, to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to spread. And uh, so that means we will not be able to control uh, control this um, this pandemic uh, um, without either getting more people vaccinated or without having additional measures uh, that prevent infections. That is very clear, and unfortunately, uh, expert had had shared that repeatedly, and now we are facing facing just the uh, the reality. Right. And, and uh, of course, uh, we all hear the numbers mentioned about uh, the vaccination rate, uh, 80, 85, 90 percent would be ideal. Israel hasn't got to that rate, but Israel is doing better. Yeah, Israel is now doing indeed better. It did very badly uh, a few months ago. And then uh, luckily our government decided uh, even before it was approved by the FDA, to go for a booster and the response was immediate. We went down from 10,000 infections per day, which is in proportion what you are having now in Germany, to a few hundred per day. Uh, the number of severely hospitalized patients uh, was crashed. So it was a huge success. Yes. And as we heard from Patrick Kramer, Israel is always a bit ahead. So maybe there is hope for us in Central Europe as well. Yeah. Uh, Professor Shaheen, you're, you're not here with us, and there is a very good reason you are online, uh, because um, just to jog people's memory, I mean, uh, 
BioNTech was founded first and foremost uh, to, to improve and individualize cancer medicine with the help of mRNA technology. And you're actually currently attending a very, very important Congress on oncology treatment uh, and, uh, and research. So it's, it's very good of you that you can make the time to be part of this panel nevertheless, because obviously your experience with mRNA technology is, uh, is unparalleled. And it's quite interesting perhaps to, to hear, maybe again, because I'm sure people have been following you over the past year, um, how you switched so fast from your uh, original research in, in mRNJ as a cancer treatment and cancer vaccine and figured out this could maybe be the answer to our prayers in this pandemic. And fast, I even stress, because normally it takes years to develop a new vaccine. You did it within less than a year. Professor Shaheen, could you perhaps re, uh, rejig our memory and maybe even explore a bit further how that happened? Yeah, uh, happy to do that. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here as guest um, of the Max Planck Society and the Weizmann Institute. And um, uh, so we are working on messenger RNA vaccines um, in, in the academic setting for more than 20 years uh, uh, and in the last 12 years also in the setting of a biotechnology company developing messenger RNA vaccines immunotherapies originally originally for cancer immunotherapy and maybe uh, I can sh shortly show you a few slides to uh, to um, give you a short basic uh, basic introduction into how messenger RNA vaccines work. Um, so the, the concept behind the messenger RNA vaccine is um, to, to transfer a messenger RNA. This is a, a molecule which is molecule type which is uh, present in almost all of our cells uh, used by the cells to transfer information transient information from the nucleus, from the DNA, to the cytoplasm uh, to instruct in the, in the cytoplasm the production of proteins. And uh, you can see this and depicted as a molecule uh, with, with a number of features in the, in, the, in the center. There is the blood blueprint where the protein information is. And as vaccine developers, uh, we are including the information here for the antigens, which we are interested in. Uh, for cancer immunotherapy, these are cancer antigens. Uh, so that we can instruct the immune cells to, to, uh, to um, uh, uh, generate immu immune responses against this protein encoded by, the, uh, by this blueprint. And outside of this, uh, this blueprint, uh, this information, there are additional uh, pieces of information. For example, how long the messenger RNA uh, should be translated and how strong the translation should be. And these are, these, uh, this is uh, a type of meta information. And this type of meta information was, um, uh, was solved by the scientific community in the last 60 years since discovery of messenger RNA. Um, and uh, we, when we started uh, our research on messenger RNA vaccines, we realized um, that the standard version of messenger RNA does not provide um, uh, sufficient protein. And this is, this is a challenge because if you don't get sufficient protein, you don't get a sufficient immune response. So part of our research, and this is, this is, this is um, innovation one, uh, uh, de dealt with the, with the question, how can we improve uh, the amount of protein produced by such messenger RNAs? And you can see on the right side that multiple modifications uh, in, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, regions outside of the, of, the, um, of the genetic information to be transferred at the CAP region, at the UTR regions, uh, 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 which, are, uh, which are elements uh, which, um, which uh, were modified or using uh, modifications, biochemical modifications, for example, uh, modi modifying the, the CAP structure, modifying the nucleosides um, that enable to increase and prolong the translation. So that was one of the innovations and of course these innovations not only translate into better cancer antigen 
translation, but also could be used for infectious disease. The second, on the next slide, the second type of innovation is, is, uh, is uh, to deliver this information, this piece of information to the right, uh, right cells in the body. And we, as immunologists, we know that, that there is a special cell type in the body, dendritic cells, which, uh, which, um, which instruct uh, uh, um, the in induction of antibody and T cell responses. And we developed formulations that allowed us to, to bring this messenger RNA. So the messenger RNA for this, for this intention is encapsulated in so-called lipid nanoparticles. And then these lipid nanoparticles, they are uh, small in the range of 60 to 80 nanometers. Uh, and if this, uh, the messenger RNA solution is injected, this lipid na uh, nanoparticles travel through the body yeah, and then uh, go into the lymph nodes and in the lymph nodes are taken up by these dendritic cells. You can see that uh, in a lymph node depicted and, uh, and messenger RNA uh, taken up in red uh, in the cells and, and in a further further um, uh, further higher resolution you can see on the right side that the dendritic cells are interacting interacting with t cells and and um, and as a as a as a result of of this delivery which is second innovation yeah this specialized delivery to dendritic cells we see a dramatic immune response uh, so on the left side you see the red dots uh, th these are t cells uh, in a lymph node which was injected with a control rna and on the right side you see a massive expansion of of the t cells uh, they are much uh, uh, um, uh, much higher number of T cells in the lymph node, uh, even three days after the inject injection of the messenger RNA. And this is a dramatic increase. And this type of dramatic increase is indeed needed to mount a, such a strong uh, immune response for, for treatment of cancer. And we benefited uh, um, from this type of strong immune response, of, of course, also when we developed our COVID-19 vaccine. On the next slide, uh, uh, you see the third innovation. It is a manufacturing innovation. Yeah? Uh, so that means we have we have solved the biology and how to improve the potency of the mRNA. And then the next question was, can we produce this messenger RNA uh, in an extremely short time? Uh, we were particularly interested in personalized cancer immunotherapy, and for this, we take the genetic information of the mutations of the patient yeah, uh, and, uh, and prepare a vaccine personalized, tailored uh, for the individual tumor of the, of the patient. And the challenge here was um, that, that this, this approach uh, takes usually up to six months, yeah? and we invested, invested uh, a, a number of improvements uh, to enable us to reduce this production time to less than five, five weeks. So this was our innovation for, for cancer immunotherapy, personalized cancer immunotherapy. But what we had created was a technology which induces powerful immune responses and allows us to make a vaccine in an extremely short time. And when we realized that we are, that we are hitting a pandemic, uh, the logic was very clear. If we have a technology, a powerful vaccine technology, which could provide us m uh, vaccines within, uh, within a few uh, weeks, and then this is a chance and also an obligation to start the development of vaccine candidates. And that, that was, uh, at the end of the, um, the day, the scientific foundation for vaccine development and the story thereafter was uh, was uh, testing 20 candidates and coming up with the right one uh, and bringing that into 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 testing in yeah. in 10,000 of subjects and then I stop here yeah uh, yeah well no thank you thank you it's 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 fascinating because uh, we had a little discussion here uh, in Munich amongst ourselves before and it was mentioned that uh, sometimes uh, research into something that nobody knows why are they doing it uh, 
the right problem suddenly has to occur and you know, wow, this is why we did this research because it's absolutely useful and helpful. And that's just one of those prime examples. And we all are so grateful, of course, that you did this research beforehand and could, uh, could get the solution that fast, so fast uh, that it actually was too fast for some authorities to, to give approval straight away. Israel, for one, uh, was very, very fast there, uh, again ahead of us. Um, and Israel, of course, also uh, went through the motions because this was a very new vaccine. It was a new vaccine technology for the first time allowed in humans. So even on the ground, it was still sort of, you know, trying as you went along. And I think that we learned something in the meantime when it comes to actually administering uh, the vaccine. I, be, I remember at the beginning there was uh, about the first and the second dose should be within three weeks. Then that was extended. Uh, so we learned a lot. Anything else we we, sh we have learned in those those last uh, well 12 months now? I think it was November 2020 that it was first uh, approved. Professor uh, Pilpil. Yeah, so we learned that the vaccine works uh, fabulously and that it provides uh, protection exactly as uh, assessed originally in the clinical trials. Uh, and not only that it allowed herd immunity to be achieved, it allowed something that for me as an, an evolutionary uh, biologist is even more alarming, uh, the potential for the next strain to arrive. So um, a concept that we are now studying is what I call evolutionary herd immunity. If herd immunity is that state where the current strain cannot propagate, Evolutionary herd immunity is a more ambitious state in which uh, not only that the current strain doesn't propagate, but the current strain doesn't mutate into something that would become the next strain. And we are worried, of course, about the next strain. And already Delta has reduced uh, something, some, some measure from the protective capacity of the current uh, vaccines. And of course, uh, the major concern is that the next, next strain might evade immunity even further. It will, if, if it arises, it will have an obvious selective advantage because it can infect people that the current strain cannot infect, those that are protected. So the struggle is ongoing. Uh, and uh, indeed, um, a very interesting uh, uh, scientific direction that uh, colleagues uh, around the world are, are now pursuing is try to predict what would be the next strain and what would be in particular a next strain that can evade the current antibodies that were produced with the current vaccine and perhaps prepare to that, uh, to that next strain ahead of time before it actually arises. Uh, so as- How do you predict? Do you have a crystal ball? Probably <laughs> not. We don't have a crystal ball. And I personally am not engaged in these predictions in, in particular, but uh, the idea is to try to mimic the evolution that the virus does um, and try to see what solutions in a very shield uh, setup in the lab uh, it might uh, give rise to and then learn which mutants, which varial mutations are likely to have an advantage either because they allow the virus to, uh, to be transferred more easily within the body or because they allow it to evade the current antibodies and see what, what are the solutions that the virus can come up with. And then where we come in is that we are trying to take Professor Shaheen's and Moderna's beautiful uh, vaccinations and try to very delicately propose, and I'll, I'll perhaps show a little bit uh, more of that later, propose very minor changes that might at once uh, uh, allow the vaccine to target well, several targets. If, if you have something to show us uh, in yeah, that yeah. context, it would be very interesting to find out how you can predict the next variants and, and redesign the vaccine accordingly. Right, right. So if I can show the, the next slide, I, I'm, as I said before, I'm a, an evolutionary biologist. I, knew next to nothing about vaccines and, and SARS-CoV-2 before the pandemic. Uh, I studied the genetic code and how it evolves, etc. But I want to show what we discovered together with colleagues, uh, actually at the Max Planck and T Tel Aviv University, um, um, uh, with an analogy. I'll start with an analogy for my other scientific passion, which is language. So you see here an apartment, you see the word apartment, and you see an apartment. And when you say apartment, you mean exactly, you understand exactly what I mean. But if you click further, the word apartment has synonyms. You can say flat, you can say sweet, and they will all win, mean the same thing. But if you click another one, once more, flat has two meanings. It's an apartment and it's something that is, uh, uh, that is surfaced. And sweet also has a meaning in music. 
So although there are three synonyms for the same word, there is also homonyms for each of them. Each of those words mean, can mean several different things. In fact, apartment is unambiguous. If you say apartment, you know exactly what I mean. But if I say flat, there is ambiguity, the same for sweet. What we discovered, what was known about the genetic code, if you click once more, all along, is that the genetic code employed synonyms. You see here in red, uh, it's uh, DNA letters or RNA letters, and they code for amino acids, which you see on the right. And we knew all along that there is ambiguity in the gen sorry, there, is synony there are synonyms in the genetic code. You can encode the same amino acid in the middle by three alternative synonymous codons or DNA words. But what we and our colleagues discovered is that the genetic code also has a certain level of ambiguity. If you use the code on there, GGU, it might mean more than one thing. Very similar to flat, meaning two different things. So what we try to do now with this information, if you click once more, is we try to take the Moderna and the BioNTech vaccine and redesign them very, very gently by proposing synonymous changes. These will not be changes that uh, will change the vaccine altogether, but they will acquire it with an implanted uh, ambiguity. And the ambiguity would be tailored exactly towards the different strains that you see on the very right-hand side of, the, of, the, of this display, such that with, presumably with the same sequence, due to the ambiguity of execution of the genetic code, it might give rise to different variants. And it might provide protection even to the next strain that hasn't yet appeared. So that's, that's roughly the notion. That sounds good. <laughs> if if uh, when when you can achieve it, I mean, in in the end, uh, if if it can be achieved, uh, Professor Shaheen, is it then still a BioNTech vaccine that we're talking about? Uh, I think what what is very clear is is um, that the development of a of a vaccine or any type of pharmaceutical uh, really builds on 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 scientific scientific accomplishments uh, coming from different fields and and of course at the end of the day if such an approach would be would uh, translate into a, a proven better protection yeah, uh, then that that uh, would be we would welcome and and uh, and ask us to use this this new insight into the developing of a next generation vaccine. That is how research and scientific progress works. That we that we always um, always compare the existing uh, innovation uh, with uh, and and ask questions: What are the shortcomings, and how can we improve that? And if the if uh, we find something, we apply it. And and our vaccine today already um, has innovations, for example, certain type of lipids, which are not directly from BioNTech and Pfizer, yeah, which, uh, which were licensed uh, and, and, and based on, on discoveries of scientists more than 20 years ago, uh, which resulted in the development of certain type of, of formulations, which are today known as lipid nanoparticles. So maybe there is hope that before too long we will be able to deal with SARS-CoV-2 just like we do with the seasonal flu, that we will be able to adapt very quickly to new strains or as Professor Pilpel mentioned, maybe even anticipate them so we're protected before they even arise. Until then, I'm not quite sure if the vaccine alone can help us beat the pandemic. Uh, and Professor Kramer, that's where I'm looking to you because I know that there's a certain range of therapies already, but we're not quite there yet, are we? Yeah, I mean, we're getting there. Um, and maybe I can tell you a little bit how we got into this whole field. Um, actually, we are one of the groups um, that investigated messenger RNA um, because in all the cells of our body, Messenger RNA is a natural messenger that carries a message um, that actually helps you to build proteins in cells. And our laboratory for the last two decades or so um, has worked on the cellular process to understand in molecular detail how that natural machinery works that produces the messenger RNA. But then when the pandemic hit, we thought, you know, how can we use our expertise 
to help understand the virus and to help maybe in the development of drugs and also, you know, in the understanding of how such medication functions and what, what the mechanisms are that underlie uh, the effect of drugs. And so what we did is that um, we visualized for the first time the molecular process that the coronavirus uses to replicate its genome. It's actually an RNA genome, not a DNA genome. But there's also a machinery, again, a polymerase enzyme, like in our cells, which uh, moves along this thread of RNA and produces a new thread of RNA. And we were together with three Chinese groups who had a bit of a jump start, as you can imagine. We were amongst the first to visualize that process. I also brought a slide, if we can see that. This is how this machinery looks like. It's called an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase complicated word um, just to copy the RNA genome. And the idea we had was that if we understand better how that process works, maybe we can help to stop the virus from uh, spreading because uh, the virus need to, needs to replicate its genome to multiply. You can only have more new viruses if you multiply the genome first. And actually then, you know, in the first year, as you know, the first drug was approved, remdesivir. Unfortunately, it was uh, not working well in, in the hospital, but this drug is actually an inhibitor of that process of viral replication. It targets this enzyme, the polymerase. And I also brought a movie uh, in the next slide. You can see a molecular movie, um, which uh, shows you how we could visualize how the drug remdesivir actually works. So it's incorporated into a growing RNA chain when the polymerase moves along the coronavirus genome. And then uh, there's this wrong building block in the RNA chain. And after the incorporation of a few more building blocks, actually exactly three, uh, the enzyme stalls. And that is because we actually visualize these atoms. You see the balls here, these um, colored balls, these are atoms that clash against each other. And this slows down the replication process. So um, remdesivir is um, an inhibitor of that process, but it's a quite poor inhibitor. And that explains to some extent why it was not successful. The other problem uh, you have with this drug is that you have to give it by transfusion to patients. So it has to be in the hospital when people are already hospitalized. But at that time, the, this phase where, where the virus, um, when the virus is replicating, is already almost over and patients are already suffering from other problems like heart problems, inflammation, and overreaction of the immune system. And such antiviral drugs therefore have to be given much earlier. And this is why we need, and that comes back to your question, why we need antiviral drugs uh, that are orally um, available. So people basically can take a pill very soon after the infection has started. Basically, when you're tested positively, you go to the doctor, the doctor confirms this is, you know, beginning uh, coronavirus infection, and then to immediately take a pill, that would be ideal because uh, you could then, um, you know, stop the um, multiplication of the virus. And the polymerase, this machinery that we visualized here is a, is a very good target to develop such drugs. Well, we, almost on a daily basis now, we get news about some sort of uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 uh, medication is being approved or certainly being looked at as a possible uh, candidate. Uh, it seems to go very fast or are we I mean, how close are we to popping that pill? Um, could, is this monopiravir, the, the red one, could that already be one of the candidates? Can I buy that in the pharmacy tomorrow? I mean, what time span are we talking about? Yeah, for that I need to explain maybe um, a little bit in more general terms how you could possibly develop drugs to stop such a virus. And there's three major strategies to do so. You could either block the virus from first entering the cells, right? Or you could block the synthesis of proteins. The, the virus encodes for 29 proteins and it needs those proteins to multiply. Or third strategy, you could block replication of the genome, what we just looked at. 
And actually now um, substances become available to interfere with all these three processes. So for example, today there was on the news that um, the European agency just approved these antibodies from Regeneron and um, Roche. And these are um, drugs which mask they bind to the virus and they mask the surface of the virus to uh, prevent the entry of the virus, right? But then this molnupiravir, for example, that was just approved last week uh, in the UK, is a drug that is orally available in contrast to these antibodies which have to be given you know, by an injection or by transfusion. But uh, this molnupiravir is interfering with the process of replication. But actually in contrast to the remdesivir which slows down this polymerase enzyme, um, the molnupiravir is introducing a lot of errors in the replication process so that in the end the genome contains so many errors that it cannot form functional viruses anymore. So there are drugs uh, emerging and most recently, actually last week, there was a drug called um, Paxlovid, mm -hmm. which is uh, from Pfizer. And uh, we don't know the data yet, we just know the press release, but it looks very promising in patients. So apparently up to 90% of the patients um, um, could, you know, or severe disease progression could be prevented in up to 90% of the patients. And that drug is actually interfering with the second process of synthesis of the proteins. It's a so-called protease inhibitor. So it blocks an essential step in the synthesis of the proteins that the virus needs to um, multiply. Now, if we have uh, those that, that, medi you know, that, that variety of medication one can almost say already, and there is obviously more to come because you're doing much more research in it. Uh, Professor uh, Shaheen, uh, is it then like medication or vaccination, or can we only deal with this pandemic in combination of both? We were, yeah, it is very clear. We, we need the combination of both. So um, uh, the vaccines are the first layer of defense. Um, it is always better to prevent an infection uh, as compared to dealing with infection. It is fantastic that we are now um, uh, getting more and more uh, um, uh, uh, therapeutics uh, or molecule, molecule classes uh, which are complementary uh, uh, to vaccines and this, this complementary uh, molecule classes uh, will be important for two aspects. First of all, uh, there are there are individuals who do not benefit from vaccines. For example, individuals with uh, with uh, immunosuppression, uh, either primary immunodeficiency uh, or immunosuppression uh, b uh, based on on treatment of autoimmune diseases. We know um, that um, this uh, this um, this um, individuals do not develop mount strong immune responses, and they could for example, benefit uh, from, from uh, uh, antibodies, long-lasting antibodies to prevent infections. And um, the second, second application is indeed if, uh, if, um, if uh, people are infected, either they, uh, because they had no vaccine uh, or because they have a breakthrough infection, and then such a treatment could be useful. We should not forget that that um, that uh, most uh, kind of um, of monotherapies uh, against viruses ended up uh, with fast development of of uh, therapeutic resistance um, due to further further evolution of the virus. So that means we can we can't uh, we can't um, uh, rely that this type of of treatments, if they are used as monotherapies. Yeah, uh, would be would uh, would uh, provide uh, definitive um, uh, uh, prevention of severe infections over over long long time. So so at the end of the day, it's wonderful that we are getting a plethora of of uh, new compounds. Yeah, uh, but vaccines vaccines have a, have an extremely important position. Uh, to avoid further evolution of the virus, to to avoid infections, to control the pandemic, and uh, and then of course this type of treatments could help to further um, reduce the mortality and uh, severe disease. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Pilpel. You wanted to add something. 
Yeah, I just want to second uh, what Professor Shaheen said. He mentioned at the end uh, uh, a preventive evolution, which is indeed yes. what we are worried about. Uh, we know it already from uh, bacteria and anti antibiotics and also from cancer and anti-cancers that those entities, they evolve so rapidly and they get such a huge advantage if they start to evade the, the treatment, the drug. So, so uh, even the best uh, drug is, is doomed to fail at some point. Uh, and when the pandemic is so widespread, the chance for the virus to develop the mutations that are needed in order to evade those treatments is just very high because there's so many trials that the virus does over the entire population. So I second very strongly uh, the statement that it's only a combination of them. The drug, in a way, is a treatment where half of the horses have already left the stable. Uh, and the vaccine is, to, is there yet to prevent them from... Nevertheless, it's, it's very comforting as, as yes. a potential patient to Absolutely. know... Absolutely. If it happens, Absolutely. it's not the end. Absolutely. Very comforting. And I would just like to share with you that we haven't forgotten you out there, the viewers, who are very, very busy submitting questions. And I suggest we just start throwing some of those questions randomly into the round. Um, I would like to start actually with uh, one that I see here from Tobias, uh, because it fits very well with what we've just been talking also. So do we have an emerging understanding of individual COVID-19 susceptibility? Who would like to take that? Professor Shaheen, do we, do we have an idea, an emerging understanding of individual COVID-19 susceptibility? Yes, I would say it, it is a beginning. Uh, so because emerging, emerging can be defined as a, also as a starting to begin. Uh, there are a number of studies uh, who, who correlated, for example, polymorphisms uh, in individuals uh, with susceptibility. Uh, um, and, uh, and also examples, for example, um, the presence of uh, alter antibodies um, against type 1 interferon, uh, which is one of the, uh, the most relevant early innate immune uh, 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 system regulators. Um, uh, there are individuals who appear to have alter antibodies so that um, interferon alpha is neutralized, and these individuals appear to have more severe infections. What is also known is, is uh, or what is also emerging as an information is is the uh, the uh, the role of the innate immune system uh, uh, for prevention prevention of infections and disease control it appears to be that particularly kids in kids this this innate immune system uh, is uh, is uh, and in young individuals uh, this innate immune system is strongly active so that this is a innate layer of, of uh, immune protection uh, so that these individuals are, um, are, uh, uh, have a better, better immunity, a faster response, innate uh, response, and thereby prevent the entry of the virus and uh, um, uh, are able to quickly respond if the virus has, has, into, uh, 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 has already managed to, to enter the cells. Perhaps we can even uh, expand that question because, uh, and, and looking at the global pandemic response, uh, because uh, not long ago, there was uh, uh, several articles about uh, the case numbers in, in many African states being remarkably low, despite the fact that their vaccination rate is very low. Do we have any idea? Is there, is there anything scientific we can say about it? Or are we still trying to figure out what it could be? Or is it simply a lack of data that we don't get from there? Yeah. Professor Pilpel. Yeah, I guess it could be many of the above. Uh, I'm not sure that the data is as reliable and that we are tracing the disease as accurately as we do in, in other parts of the world. Uh, uh, but on top of that, uh, it is known that certain uh, genetic markers that do segregate in different ethnical groups can confer some levels of protection to, to the pandemic. Uh, a beautiful paper that I've read recently analyzed genomes of uh, uh, Asian people. Um, and they deduced from, uh, very, by very sophisticated bioinformatics 
that a SARS uh, pandemic, not COVID-2, of course, mm -hmm. a SARS pandemic hit Asia uh, uh, um, thousands of years ago. We see, of course, only those, the, 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 um, the, um, only those who survived uh, get to, say, to show us their genomes. But the genomes of the, of the Asians are uh, highly, uh, pre they show high prevalence of certain mutations such as the interferon uh, protective response that was mentioned here and others. So definitely ethnicity could modulate the extent of protection uh, that you get in, in an innate fashion. And maybe this explains something about the numbers in Africa, but this is uh, just a speculation, of course. Susceptibility to COVID-19 surely also plays a role in looking at what kind of medication and therapy we need for certain groups of people, Professor Kramer. Yeah, but I think we're a long way away from understanding that and from turning that into reality. I think now we are at the stage where the first drugs become available. We have to be very careful giving them to patients um, because they will have side effects. There's no effect without side effects. Um, and we have to also, I think, make sure that people understand that those drugs are not, um, you know, should be used for high risk groups. They should be used if there's a, a good chance that somebody develops a very severe progression of the disease. They should not be used, for example, you know, people thinking, oh, now I can party because there will be a drug and I can prophylactically just take the drug. We're far from, from this, um, so it's very important to make sure that it's communicated that yes, there will be drugs, but you know, they will not prevent severe disease in all patients, only in a fraction, and we don't know why yet. And also they will have some side effects as all drugs have, and we should only take them if it's um, really indicated and a you know, medical doctor um, considers that to be important to be taken at that particular moment by a certain patient. So we're far from you know, a, a situation where we could even individualize um, or stratify groups and give certain drugs to certain groups. It's always good to remind ourselves of the severity of the situation that we're still in and that we can't take it lightly. Uh, I would like to turn to another question by Yulika which is somewhat echoing uh, the start of our talk, but clearly it is something that moves a lot of people. So today we have the highest infection numbers since the beginning of the pandemic, at least here in Germany. What are your feelings about this? Are you disappointed, angry or sad? Or does this motivate you to conduct your research even more intensely? Who would like to go for that? I can see Professor I can start. Pilker. <laughs> Uh, it is frustrating that, uh, that uh, vaccine hesitancy on one hand is understood, uh, especially if you, if you have no background in science. It, it sounds uh, scary. Uh, I don't know, to take an example from myself, if tomorrow there will be a, a crash of the stock exchange, not being an economist, I'll be, I'll be with anxiety, but I will try to, to listen to the, to the experts. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not so much... Uh, in angry about this anxiety, but what we do have to, as scientists, and this is exactly what we do today, we have to engage the, uh, the, the public in a much better understanding and the type of trust that is needed. Uh, and for that, we have to be transparent, we have to be clear, we have to talk at eye level, and we have to, we should have prepared the grounds by better uh, scientific literacy of the, of, the, of the population even before the pandemic so that when something like that happens, people have an immediate accessibility to scientific terms uh, and appreciation of the type of uh, rigor that, with which we do research. So we have to, I think we have to earn the, the, the trust of the public uh, to engage the public in such uh, conversations, in such uh, meetings and hopefully we'll, we'll get uh, better and better in, in, in bringing the message. Professor Kramer. Uh, I think it's an important question simply because science is done by human beings and um, we have to you know, move into the unknown and you can only do that when you have resilience, uh, when you can overcome frustration and when you have motivation. And of course, you know, the prospect of helping people is, is very motivating and I mean, I just tell you from my personal perspective, when I saw that the mRNA vaccines work, 
because I was asked before, you know, you're an mRNA expert, can you tell us whether this will work? And I was always like, I really hope so, but it's 50-50. You know, there's all kinds of reasons why it shouldn't work. But then it needs individuals who are persistent, who believe in their ideas, who push them forward and then get a breakthrough. And so th this human component of science is, should never be underestimated. It, we need motivation and I think, you know, science has probably never been highlighted so much around the globe as during this pandemic, you know, in the age of the internet. and. Um, this is, of course, very motivating for scientists. On the other hand, it has accelerated science so dramatically. It was already a race. Who is first? Who discovers something first? And now it has accelerated things even more. I mean, the structure I showed you, you know, when we first visualized the replication, we finished the manuscript and the next day it was online. The whole world could read it. And many colleagues do so. So it leads to an acceleration that almost every second new information comes to your phone, you know, that somebody has published something, somebody has found a correlation here. So we also have to be careful with mental health issues, mm -hmm. especially amongst scientists who are at the forefront, because it's a huge pressure also that the young people uh, take on them. That is a very, very interesting point, and I would like to pick up uh, combine that with a question uh, that was sent and basically uh, asked uh, Professor Shaheen because I mean how the question that came from a viewer how does it feel to literally save the world with research and development that almost nobody in broader society knew about two years ago and add the immense pressure that comes with this res responsibility so uh, Professor Shaheen how, how does it feel to literally save the world? And how do you deal with the pressure of the responsibility that goes along with it? Uh, yeah, it, it is, of course, we, we, we feel absolutely humbled and, and privileged to, be, to have been in the right position at the right time uh, and were able to, to respond. And, and we have also to add that we, that, um, that uh, this is of course an accomplishment uh, of, uh, of the whole scientific community uh, of, our, of our teams. Uh, and, uh, and this is also an accomplishment of course, of course of generation of scientists who have contributed to the basic, basic, um, basic understanding of mRNA, the discovery of the mRNA, the understanding of the structure of the mRNA and uh, many things which, uh, which help uh, to do that. Uh, as a scientist, uh, we always try to understand what we can influence. It is important to be to be to be to be on the one side ha have have a clear vision, yeah, and and and, and imag imagination, and to understand that that things could work, and we always believed in, in the power of mRNA and, and that we could be able to develop personalized vaccines. That's the one. On the other side, as scientists, we are, of course, of course, skeptical and detail oriented and, and, and uh, figure out thousand reasons why some things should not work. Yeah? Uh, and we are, we are the, the most skeptical uh, people uh, regarding, regarding to our own research. Uh, so we deal with the with the pressure in the way that we really focus on our work. It is it is like like uh, like in in uh, treating patients, like a surgeon doing the surgery. He is extremely focused. He does not uh, realize anything else as as doing the task. And we are in this performance modus and and are not dealing with with um, too much with personal feelings uh, uh, and uh, i hope that 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 uh, if we accomplish and i expect that this could uh, happen happen next summer and uh, that we are that we are that we are in a situation that we have uh, some some herd immunity because because more people are vaccinated and more people are infected, that we can can go back into a modus where we can uh, have a have a work which is which is more proactively uh, directed into long term research and not only any more reactive in asking the question what needs to be done next with regard to this COVID nineteen pandemic.
that, that, that leads beautifully into another question that uh, is also from the audience, uh, because mRNA uh, technology, mRNA research, especially uh, with a view to cancer research and uh, obviously COVID-19, that is very much in the spotlight right now. And hopefully uh, it will be that next year in summer we will have this kind of herd immunity to take all that pressure off you and, and all the colleagues here so that you can start concentrating on other things. For example, using mRNA research in other fields. I know a few weeks ago we heard about a possible mRNA uh, malaria vaccine in the works. What, what else are you looking at or hoping to be able to look at? Yes, this is indeed the exciting aspect, which which uh, which provides us um, uh, a lot of uh, energy. That we are now in a situation, and that the technology is is uh, is validated uh, with the approval of the first mRNA vaccine. Uh, a door is now open to develop other type of mRNA treatments. We are focusing on the one side on infectious diseases like malaria and tuberculosis. Uh, uh, where other vaccines, vaccines uh, where the vaccine development or where other technologies had really difficulties to to uh, provide um, uh, highly active vaccines, we believe mRNA m might be suitable because because we uh, we might be able to engineer polyspecific immune responses against multiple targets. Uh, these are complex pathogens with a, with a number of uh, immune escape mechanisms. So that's one direction we, uh, we, we are going. The second is, is extending our cancer immunotherapy work. We have um, at the moment multiple cancer immunotherapies in clinical stage, um, uh, uh, 12, 12 mRNA-based based, um, drug candidates as, um, as vaccines for different type of tumors, but also mRNA-coded antibodies, cytokines, combination therapies. This is, this is exciting and ongoing, and, and this is also the reason why I'm here in Washington at the CITSI conference. Uh, to present some of our work uh, and update about uh, on clinical data. Well, it'll, it'll be great uh, when the world is again ready and open and less stressed uh, to be actually able to focus on, on that kind of research. Until we get there, Professor Kramer, would a vaccine mandate help? It's a word that I hardly dare to utter in Germany, it's hotly discussed, but we had a mandate when it came to smallpox. Why are we hesitant now? It's another very important question, but also an extremely difficult one, because as you know, in Germany, um, it was always said, and there was always a consensus that we don't not want to have that. Um, of course, you know, um, as far as I understand the laws, you have to balance things. On, on the one hand, the state has to um, make sure that people are healthy or should help you know as much as possible to keep the population healthy on the other hand um, I'm a free person so I decide freely whether I want to get a certain medical treatment I personally I know that there's now a majority according to opinion polls that the majority of Germans uh, wants to have a vaccination mandate I also know that yesterday the um, president of the German National Academy, Leopoldina, um, suggested that it should be revisited. And I heard today in the news that uh, the Ethics Council of Germany also said that at least for some professional groups like health workers or um, people working, you know, with elderly or so, that they should, that it should be reconsidered to have such a vaccination mandate. I personally, I think it should be discussed and it should be discussed especially uh, including, you know, different representatives from the population, not just lawyers, uh, so, you know, different people. But I personally think that there's a great danger if we do that, that this division that we already see uh, in the society, a majority of people who is pro-vaccination and is vaccinated, and a minority who is still skeptical or even th says that they, they do not want to get vaccinated no matter what, that this division will be enforced um, by a vaccination mandate. And we don't want to have, you know, massive conflicts within our society. We have other problems. Mm -hmm. So my personal view as of today is that we have to be very careful with that. If we consider that then only for certain professional groups 
and it has to be done very carefully and including, you know, different parts of the society. So it is still walking then on, on eggshells. Uh, Professor Pilpil, perhaps we jump to the next question, which is sort of going in the similar vein. Uh, there's somebody asking, I think we agree that we cannot continue contact contact restrictions indefinitely. Uh, is there a point in time, for example, after the third vaccination or an alternative therapy when the effect wears off again, when it's more advisable to get infected with the real virus in order to confront the body with it? Yeah, that's actually a very perceptive question. Uh, and it relates to something that we study in the lab. And I want to demonstrate it very simply. Uh, um, suppose that you were vaccinated against one strain and that strain led to, with a mutation to another strain, and that one led to another, uh, with another mutation to another strain. So you have a perfect vaccination for the, against the strain that you, uh, immunity against the strain that you were vaccinated, and it stands to reason that you would have some immunity against the next one, but you might not have against the next one. Now, the paradoxical effect could be that if you are so well protected against this next one, you, your body would not get to train on this one, and when the next one appears, you are left without protection. So perhaps somewhat paradoxically, and this is something that immunologists and, and epi epidemiologists are thinking about, is that some exposure that remains sublethal and not dangerous can allow you to update your immunity towards new versions so that when you're always up to date, you might be one version behind, but not two or three versions behind. So I think it, is, it, it, it calls for an interesting question. Um, I wouldn't recommend being infected in, 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 in purpose because you, you cannot know how it would end, but there is something to it, yes. And it's not just that we don't know how it will affect you, whether will you fall seriously ill or not. There are also what happens afterwards, the, the infamous uh, long COVID. The long there's COVID, there's yes. a lot of things we still don't quite understand about the virus. Uh, so yeah, maybe, maybe not to try and get uh, no. affected, uh, uh, infected on purpose. Um, maybe that's actually one for you as well, because I can see the word mutations. In which way are mutations of the virus affecting the research for a modified vaccine? Can you elaborate why the origin version of the vaccine, the original version of the vaccine, is still so effective in terms of the Delta variant? Professor yeah. Pilpil. Yeah. Um, yeah, the original version is still effective for Delta, although I think uh, the effectiveness has declined. And uh, of course, the worry is that when, uh, if Delta accumulates more and more mutations, actually develops into a new strain, uh, uh, we will see further decline in the efficacy of the vaccine. Um, yeah, we, we actually follow the, the evolution of the strains. And uh, indeed, the, the greatest worry is that the virus might feel an evolutionary pressure to evade immunity even further. Even if it compromises some of its other uh, machineries, it may have an advantage because it can infect more people, those that were already uh, vaccinated. So the course of the evolution of the virus is something that we are trying to watch very carefully. And as I said at the beginning, we are trying to understand ahead of time what mutations the virus di still didn't think about, but we think that it might be able to explore if pressured towards evasion of immunity. I'm the, the spoil sport mentioning that with 10 minutes to go, uh, I would like to include some more questions, but already with uh, the last uh, round of questions here for you. Uh, what I wanted to know from all of you, and I would like to start with Professor uh, Shaheen, is are there any positive takeaways from the pandemic? Perhaps linked to that question, will the development of cancer vaccines profit from the success of mRNA vaccines against corona? Yeah, there are a number of, of, uh, of positive developments. First of all, um, the establishment of messenger RNA as a, as a new, new pharmaceutically validated technology opening up the door for the development of many, many other type of, of, um, of mRNA-based treatments and, and allowing us also to accelerate our research. But what the pandemic has also shown is, is uh, how incredibly important science is and, uh, and, uh, and how the scientific and the medical community accomplished in, in less, than, less than two years. Uh, to to uh, to come up with multiple vaccines with with several in inhibitors with a deep 
uh, increasingly deep understanding of the pathogen um, uh, with with uh, with um, with a complete change how how um, uh, scientific uh, scientific insights are published uh, the example that that papers are available for for reading uh, the next day after they ha have been submitted this is all great progress and and it is also a thing for the majority of the population it became also clear that now science could be uh, could be not only a marginal aspect of society, but also also uh, um, uh, go into the center of the society and 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 um, and uh, and could be seen as as um, as a as a uh, as a way to solve uh, um, uh, challenges of mankind, which are not only related to health but also related to to other other um, challenges that that are affecting us globally. Right, right. Science getting so much more attention right now and hopefully that is a positive outcome, that that is a keeper, that this is not disappearing uh, when eventually we have eradicated SARS-CoV-2, uh, Professor Pilpel. Will we ever? Will we ever eradicate the disease? Well, I don't know. Uh, we say in Judaism that uh, since the temple was destroyed, prophecy was given to the stupid. So uh, I will not attempt to, to, to be a prophet on this. Uh, I hope so. Uh, we have, humanity have eradicated uh, other uh, viral diseases and other pandemics uh, with uh, weapons that are uh, middle ages weapon compared to what we have now. Uh, so there is a hope uh, I, I think we see the, the signs of it uh, already. It seems that we have several uh, very effective tools uh, at our disposal. And uh, I, I'm, I'm optimistic. Optimistic that it could potentially become like what we now know with the flu. We have to continue with booster vaccinations for the years to come in order to keep the virus under control. That would be a question. Do you think that could be it? Again, a prophetic... Yeah, a prophet. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, as Einstein said once, making prediction is very difficult, especially when it comes to the future. So, uh, <laughs> um, again, I don't know. Uh, certain viruses are... Uh, you a third booster already stops them. Uh, it gains, it gives you uh, uh, a long protection. We don't know if COV, uh, if COV-2 is of that type or not. Um, if it, if it will end up being getting a booster every year that needs to be updated, perhaps, then I think uh, humanity can live with that. Professor Kramer, how has the pandemic changed your work? How has it affected you? Um, yeah, as I said, science, um, you know, there's never been a spotlight on science like this. Um, then um, it has accelerated our work. Um, but also, I think what is very different is that many more colleagues um, went into science communication. So many colleagues helped, you know, to try to convince people that they should get vaccinated, to explain how the vaccine works. Um, and I think that is also a positive aspect. But we have to, um, in the future, make sure that the correct information is provided. We have more and more fake news. We have also an acceleration in the social media uh, with bots and so forth, and uh, that divides society. And I think scientists have a very important role to communicate, let's say, the current truth or what we know is true from the data that we have and to communicate also the limitations of our data. And that is something that has, um, I think, um, really big, everybody has now become aware of, of this, how important that is. And that is probably uh, also a chance that comes from this crisis. I would have loved to close it with this fairly uplifting response from the three of you, but I don't want to cheat. And we have, according to my watch, five minutes. And there is a question that could potentially be a downer. Uh, depends on your answer. So here it comes. COVID-19 seems to be the latest and so far most severe entry in a list of global pandemics that have occurred this century. For example, SARS-2002, uh, H, uh, H1, wasn't it? H1 and T? H, T and T? No. 
H1N1. H1, exactly. H1N1. There you see, it's just too far away. What comes next? And not to forget uh, the, the Spanish flu, of course. Uh, yeah. So do we have to be prepared for worse? And how do we prepare for it? Professor Kramer. I think this is another excellent question. Um, I think, you know, there's a part of the future that we can um, predict. So we know we have to go into alternative energies. We know we have to reduce CO2 and so forth. We know we have to stop, you know, cutting down trees in the tropical forests and so forth. But then there's a part of the future that we cannot predict. And this was so well illustrated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, some people predicted it, but widely it was not on our screen. And so for that part of the future that cannot be predicted, we can only prepare by basic research, just like the basic research that led to the mRNA vaccine that no one could predict, you know, a few years back. And I think that is why we have to have this consensus in society uh, that research should be supported, even if it appears useless at the time it's done. Because there will be a moment in the future where we suddenly need a technology that everybody thought is useless, mm -hmm. and then it may rescue us. Then I will throw that very last question, a very specific one, uh, into the round. Presumably, uh, it's one for Professor Pilpil or Professor uh, Shaheen. What are believed to be the main reasons for vaccinated individuals getting COVID-19, even very severely? Would a vaccine that is administered via the mucosa be useful? Any thoughts on that? Who would like to go first? I look at you, Professor Shaheen, but... Uh... Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so as, um, as um, already stated, um, severe infections are relatively uh, uh, rare in, in pre-vaccinated subjects. So we have now data up to 12 months and, uh, and um, the, um, uh, the rate of severe infections increase in, uh, indeed uh, after, after nine, nine months. Th this is declining uh, antibody response, declining T-cell response, and, uh, and, uh, and also, also um, the preconditions, disease preconditions in, 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 in individuals. Uh, so there is a, a most recent publication publication from UK uh, showing that if you if you if you um, uh, if you um, regard high risk if you take out high risk population yeah, uh, f f uh, then 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 severe infections uh, are extremely rare in the overall population. So that means the clinical risk um, uh, conditions are well defined like adipositas and, um, and, uh, and chronic diseases. Um, and there might be individual factors as, as already, already mentioned and that individuals might uh, have uh, not uh, um, uh, 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 an antibody response uh, uh, which is equivalent. We see that in our, when we investigate neutralizing antibody responses, there are um, a certain percentage of individuals who did not mount antibodies. We don't know why. Yeah? Uh, and there are individuals, in the individuals where we see a faster decline of antibodies. So there are many reasons. Uh, uh, the fact is that, that, um, that the most most easy way to deal with that, as, as data from Israel show, yeah, uh, this was also discussed today, is uh, to do a third, uh, third injection, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which dramatically reduces uh, also the rate of severe infections. Yeah? So instead of figuring out uh, what is the reason, uh, have, uh, have a more pragmatic approach of, of, of booster doses. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I will have to say that uh, at this point, this is a wrap. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Shaheen, for uh, taking the time and joining this panel, even though you are very, very busy now with this uh, Congress, uh, also on cancer research. And uh, we look forward to everything that comes out of it. Uh, Professor Tilpel, thank you so much. Professor Kramer, thank you so much. I think it's become crystal clear that a lot has been achieved 
at lightning speed in those last 12 months or before in order to lead to the first vaccine and with medication. And now we're even talking about a vaccine that can be redesigned. Um, but I think it's also become clear that you won't be without work for a long time. Uh, and we count on you. So thank you so much for all the work you're doing for on humanity's behalf. And uh, best of luck for it, of course. And at this point, I would also like to thank all of you uh, for joining us this evening. And whether you get vaccinated or not, we don't have a mandate in Germany. It is your decision. But do wear a mask, do keep a distance, do follow specific hygiene rules. I think a lot can be gained with that already. Stay healthy, stay safe. Big thank you also to our hosts, of course, uh, the Israeli uh, Embassy here in Munich and the Max Planck Society. Have a nice evening wherever you are joining us from right now and stay safe. <laughs>